During muscle contraction, actin filaments are pulled toward the center of the sarcomere. The simultaneous contraction of the sarcomeres shortens the myofibrils, and the entire muscle cell contracts. This is how a muscle cell responds to action potentials in the motor neuron. When many muscle cells contract together, the result is movement. We move our bodies by shortening or contracting our muscles. Let's take a closer look. A muscle consists of parallel muscle fibers. Each fiber is a single cell in close contact with a motor neuron. Each muscle cell contains bundles of parallel myofibrils, shown in red, surrounded by endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. An action potential traveling down a motor neuron initiates an action potential in the muscle cell. The action potential spreads along the membrane and down tubules that extend into the cytoplasm, causing the myofibrils to contract. Each myofibril consists of a series of sarcomeres arranged end to end. The sarcomere is the contractile unit of muscle. Each sarcomere consists of thick filaments of myosin, shown in purple, and thin filaments of actin, shown in orange. A sarcomere contracts when its actin filaments slide past its myosin filaments. Contraction shortens the sarcomere, but does not change the length of the actin or myosin filaments. The myosin filaments have heads that bind and pull actin repeatedly, shortening the sarcomere. How do the myosin heads pull actin? In a relaxed muscle, the myosin binding sites on actin are blocked by a protein complex, and ADP and phosphate are bound to each myosin head. An action potential causes the ER to release calcium ions, which bind to the protein complex, causing it to shift and expose the myosin binding sites. The myosin head binds to actin. When ADP and phosphate are released, the myosin head bends, pulling the actin. This is called the power stroke. Next, ATP binds to the myosin head, causing it to detach from actin. When the ATP is broken down to ADP and phosphate, the myosin head extends. The sequence repeats as long as calcium ions are present. Bind, power stroke, detach, extend. The combined work of many myosin heads causes the actin filaments to slide past the myosin filaments. When the action potentials stop, calcium ions are pumped back into the ER, the myosin binding sites on actin are again blocked, and the muscle relaxes. In the hierarchy of movement control are several subcortical regions. The basal ganglia, which include the caudate, putamen, globus pallidus, substantia nigra, and subthalamic nucleus, are in charge of executing all desired movements communicated from the cortex. Put more simply, if the cortex is the coach creating the plays, the basal ganglia is part of the team responsible for executing those plays. The basal ganglia also control the inhibition of unwanted movements. As you can imagine, the neurons involved in inhibition are constantly at work. If your inhibitory neurons were not working, your arms, head, and legs would jerk and swing in different directions all on their own. Patients with Huntington's disease, for example, display these types of large, involuntary movements because the inhibitory neurons in their basal ganglia have died. The cerebellum controls repetitive movements that require accurate aiming and timing which are essential for passing the ball and running up and down the court. People with cerebellar damage lose coordination and often appear clumsy, bumping into things and tripping. The cerebellum helps to smoothly guide our movements toward targets. The reticular activating system regulates muscle tone. Without it, you would completely collapse. The brainstem and spinal cord are lowest in the hierarchy. 
The brainstem and spinal cord relay messages from the brain to the muscles, control posture, and control reflexive movements. When you play basketball or any kind of complex physical activity that involves movement and decision making, several different parts of your brain are working simultaneously to produce normal movement. The nervous system controls complex motor movements, such as shooting a free throw or diving for a loose ball, in a hierarchical, top-down fashion. This means that the cortex, which is at the highest level, designs, plans, and initiates movement and send signals down to the subcortical brain regions to execute and coordinate those movements. Essentially, the cortex is the idea person, and the subcortical regions are the technicians. The cortex is in charge of determining what you will do and how you will do it. In a game of basketball, the cortex would analyze sensory information, such as the location of an opponent, and integrate it with thoughts and memories. For example, if you are on offense, you use sensory information to avoid the opponent. If you are on defense, you use that same sensory information to disrupt your opponent's movements. Your cortex is making decisions based on the sensory information it's receiving, and your past experiences with these situations, which are stored in memory. There are different parts of the cortex, and they must all work together to produce normal movement. But each part has a specific role. Consider a basketball player executing a jump shot. The prefrontal cortex is involved in the planning of the shot. The premotor cortex helps organize the movement sequences involved in taking the shot before the shot is actually executed. The primary motor cortex is in charge of general movement plans, like the arm and leg movements involved in taking the shot. The primary motor cortex is somatotopically organized, which means that each part of your body is controlled by a different part of the primary motor cortex. Adjacent body parts are controlled by adjacent parts of the cortex. Large parts of your body, however, like your back, are not always controlled by large parts of cortex. You can see what this disproportionate allocation of cortical tissue looks like in what's called a homunculus, the drawing you see here. Other parts of the cortex play supporting roles in movement control. The posterior parietal association cortex helps to identify the positions of various body parts and of objects around you. This is helpful in basketball, for example, when catching the ball. The left parietal lobe is specialized for operation of limbs, hands, and eyes within immediate interpersonal space. On the basketball court, this is essential for moving your hands where you want in order to dribble the ball and keep it away from an opponent. The dorsolateral prefrontal association cortex plays a key role in voluntary response initiation decisions. Damage to this part of the brain would make it impossible for you to separate relevant and irrelevant sensory feedback about your movements, a process called sensory gating. Yeah!